Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Your Longevity Blueprint podcast. Today, I have Terry Cochran on as a guest. She's an integrative practitioner and thought leader in sustainable health and longevity. She's the founder of the Global Sustainable Health Institute and has developed the Cochran Method, which integrates a multi-level bio-individualized metabolic health modality. Terry specializes in complex health conditions. She also serves to maximize the human potential in ballerinas, professional athletes, and Olympic hopefuls. She has a private clinical practice in the Metro Washington, D.C area. She launched her groundbreaking and an Amazon best-selling new release book in 2018, The Wild Atarian Diet, Living as Nature Intended. Terry received her Bachelor's of Science from the University of Florida and an advanced degree from Huntington School of Health Sciences. She is also trained in craniosacral herbology, healing touch, and is a certified coach practitioner. Terry has also spent nearly 20 years as an executive for a Fortune 500 company. She believes longevity starts in the womb. And I love that because I mentioned that in many of my episodes that aging and longevity truly start in the womb. So welcome, Terry. Thank you, Stephanie. So good to be with you. Um, tell our listeners your story, your journey into doing what you do. Well, I believe that when um, great uh, dissonance happens in our lives, there's a greater purpose. And so, as you mentioned, I was in uh, the corporate world. Uh, working for a um, one of the largest financial institutions in the country, when running a business unit for them. But my first born, um, by the age of three, we were told to expect uh, brain seizures, he, not to go past by four. He had life-threatening asthma. He wasn't talking. He was barely walking. And um, it was a journey of uh, first trying to think about how we might accept this diagnosis, but being a Cuban refugee and having a solution seeking um, matrix instilled in me, I started thinking about, well, what if there's another way? What if they didn't quite fully understand the why behind his condition? And uh, so I had my day job and my night job was trying to figure him out. And so uh, Fast forward at the age of 10, he was doing a lot better. People were calling me Dr. Terry at work. Uh, I was getting more questions in my office around why is my child having bleeding eczema than you know, how to, how to uh, risk manage a deal. So um, I decided to uh, leave that career and go back to school. And this was in my early 40s. And now fast forward 15 years later, we're celebrating our 15th year of my company. Uh, and we really, uh, developed a methodology that is um, truly, at, I believe, the forefront of sustainability, sustainable health, and longevity. Awesome. Well, what is the Wildatarian Diet? You wrote this book, and obviously that has to do with the sustainable health model you've created. So it has a catchy name, the Wildatarian Diet. So that to me, you know, if I hadn't heard of this, I would think, okay, you're eating wild game. <laughs> well, tell us the benefits of that. Like, what is the wildatarian diet and how is this different and important to longevity? So what's so interesting is the wildatarian diet falls under the umbrella of my methodology, which is the Cochrane method. And this diet is really eating to your genetic blueprint and your current state of health. And what I've discerned over our um, research and the clinical outcomes in my practice is the uh, tenets of the wildatarian diet also involve protein, sulfur, and fat malabsorption. And the underlying or the underpinning beneath that is that in the protein scenario, we have found, and the clinical research proves it, and so do our clinical outcomes, that due to the crowding conditions uh, within which we raise our animals, uh, chicken being the most affected, is that the crowding conditions is now creating an environment for truncated protein structures to be created in the tissue of these animals. And these truncated protein structures by the name of amyloids are indigestible in our body. And studies from Cambridge and Japan show that they are responsible for contributing to over 80% of what's going on in our country with a not, from an autoimmune perspective kidney disease, cancer, infertility. So it's a really big deal. And we found that when we go to wild game or um, wild fish and shellfish uh, or non-mycotoxic uh, legumes and um, vegetables and fruits, 
then we can really help mitigate the reactivation of pathogenic loads. And so what we found through our practice is that, and also in the clinical literature, is that these amyloids were actually reactivating viruses and building biofilm. And biofilm is that which protects many of our uh, pathogens such as candida and strep and staph and even the spirochete of Lyme. And so by mitigating and minimizing the amyloids through the dietary process, then we were finding that actually we were resolving Hashimoto's and Bell's palsy and polycystic ovarian syndrome as a result of not creating a feeder system for these uh, viruses and other pathogens. So that's a, that's a mouthful and that's very complex. So to break this down, <laughs> you're in, what you're trying to do, it sounds like, is avoid the proteins that are higher in amyloid like chicken, which you call the dirty bird. So when, when I think of amyloid, what immediately comes to my mind is amyloid plaque in the brain, which causes dementia. So I, I do associate the word amyloid with bad for my health, not good for longevity. <laughs> so I think what you were saying um, is that chicken specifically has very high amounts of the of amyloid, right? So, which kind of like, whoa, but <laughs> most individuals, especially some individuals who are trying to lose weight, they think chicken's a good a protein, leaner protein to consume if they're trying to avoid red meat for their cholesterol or whatnot. You know, they may think that they're, they're choosing a better protein by consuming chicken. Um, but it sounds like you're saying the chicken that are um, not like pasture raised that are more grown. Um, the commercial raised chicken are the ones that are gonna have the highest amount of amyloids, is that correct? So what if you have chickens in your backyard? Are they still gonna have higher amounts of amyloid? Well, that's a really good question. And so what, what we do also know is that genetics are passed now generationally. And so uh, if you have heritage farm birds, that's a different story than even if that chicken is raised in your backyard, but its mother was a and chicken. <laughs> so we have to go back and really find out the lineage of that chicken because it is uh, these, these uh, DNA is being passed through generationally. Do we know how many generations or we don't know at this point how far? Yeah, what I can tell you is that um, we have, uh, I had a story which is really interesting because these amyloids will also affect glucose metabolism of a gentleman who had osteomyelitis, which is a bacterial infection of the roots or bone. He's also a type 1 diabetic, and he could not resolve his osteomyelitis. Well, within a month of working with us, his osteomyelitis was better, but he, has, he had dropped his use of insulin by up to 90%, and his wow. blood sugar had dropped from like 400 to 120. It was really miraculous, and he had a one meal of chicken, and his blood sugar went up by 250 points for four days. And he thought, well, that's just really weird. Um, let's try it again. A month later, he tried the same thing and the same thing happened. So, uh, you know, we have a direct corollary there and we have many other anecdotal incidences such as that, that really speak to the detrimental power of the chicken. And I believe that Dr. Mercola recently came out with some information around chicken that it's also really high in omega-6, which is an inflammatory yep. body acid. Other studies point that it, it um, breeds E. coli, you know, that it's, it really starts reactivation of E. coli linked to so many UTIs. Um, wow. And E. coli and Candida live together, Candida being a fungal infection, and Candida, or Candida being a fungal uh, organism that when overgrown can really mess with our brain because it affects um, our mental health through affecting the dopamine. Genes. So, so you unpacked a lot a few minutes ago. So we first, <laughs> you first introduced how amyloids are bad and they're fine in our chicken. And then you transitioned a little bit to mycotoxins and really choosing the lower mycotoxin. Um, I think you were alluding to grains. So are you saying that the chicken are eating the, the grains that are loaded with mycotoxins and thus the, Another, make that connection for me. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, chicken are primarily fed corn. Um, 90%, over 90% of the corn in the United States is genetically modified. So we have that interruption, first of all. But then the way that corn is uh, stored is that it has a mycotoxin, which is a fungal metabolite. And these mycotoxins, I call them fire starters, were creating 
built and building biofilm. And what the research shows and what our clinical outcomes prove is that the biofilm will create amyloids and the amyloids will build biofilm. And so they're having this nice little ping pong match fortifying each other and we're losing. And so, for example, peas are considered a mycotoxin, a green pea. And a lot of people try to manage you know, a healthy lifestyle with eating, consuming pea protein before they work out. Well, that could be dysregulating your insulin. Uh, peanut butter, I call it the devil on steroids because that is a high oxalate food, which we'll talk about in a minute in the problems with oxalate, but it's also an aflatoxin. So it is a mycotoxin of grand proportions and it's high mold. And so that is really a problem. And you know, we've linked in many cases, peanut butter tied to diabetes. Who thought, you know, something that is supposed to be a healthy protein and a good fat is actually potentially tripping you into type two diabetes uh, because if you've had strep in your background, uh, these mycotoxins can reactivate strep antibodies, which then has been clinically proven to just regulate insulin. Wow. So you were, you were also alluding to just viruses getting reactivated. You, again, you unpacked a lot. So I just want to break this down for the listener. So I, I think what you were saying was that uh, viruses can use or hide in, do they hide in the amyloids or they hide in the biofilm? So they can hide in biofilm, but viruses actually are being reactivated by the amyloid protein. Okay. This is thriving protein, thriving protein. And so, um, and viruses do hide in certain of our organs. Um, Hashimoto is the, the autoimmune version of thyroid dysfunction, hypothyroid dysfunction. Um, there are some studies that prove over 80% of that has been linked to the Epstein Barr virus, which is the mono virus. And um, which you may have been exposed to years back, but then you're saying you eat these foods and essentially the virus gets reactivated, so then it can contribute to this disease? Absolutely. And it just what I found personally, and it was really interesting, Stephanie, as I was writing the book. All of a sudden, I went from being completely healthy to non-functioning overnight. And what I learned through the process uh, was that I had seven viruses reactivate in me due to stress. And Epstein-Barr was through the roof, cytomegalovirus, um, parvovirus, varicella, zoster, um, HSV-1, and I had liver damage, I had brain swelling, I had complete neuropathy. Wow. They thought, what was really interesting is they thought I had Lyme because the cytomegalovirus and there's clinical literature for that can prove to have a false positive in the Western blood in certain strains of Lyme. And so they were treating me for Lyme when in fact it was coming from And so now I actually look at Lyme through the lens of the virus because this virus, even if you do have the Lyme back and its, it's co-infections, uh, they're also being fed by this phenomenon. Sure. I, I'm just going to pause for one second. I can just barely hear you, and I don't know. I mean, I think they'll be able to turn up the volume a bit, but you're just, your content is so good that I don't want us to have to redo anything. <laughs> that better? See, your, your audio just, I think, I don't know if it's when you turn your head, but like I only caught a few of those words. Okay, how's that? A lot better. Okay. A lot better. Thank you. <laughs> just don't want to miss out on any of this good stuff. Um, okay, so let me to transition. Yeah, let me um, hold on a second. I'm, my lights, the light is just in here because we're going through a thunderstorm. So let me just um, move this lighting here so that it's better. See if that works. Um, yeah, hold on. Since we're there, we go. Uh, yeah, we're, it's a uh, weird, weird lighting today in the, in the office. Whoa, because I'm in the office, uh, seeing clients all day long. <laughs> That's all right. You know what? Volume is more important for the podcast than lighting anyways. <laughs> um, so I'll, we'll, we'll restart here again. So how did you know you had all these viruses? Did you have a blood panel run with antibodies or how did you know? I did. Um, we do. I also have my own method of applied kinesiology. So within my office, I was testing for those um viruses. And then when I had the blood panels done, oh my goodness, my um, IgG of Epstein-Barr and um, all the others were in the hundreds. Um, so it was a reactivation. And I actually 
not only had IgG, but I had IgM, which was inactive. Wow. Which is really, everything just got really turned on and um, very interesting phenomena. But once, once I was able to understand what was happening and really went wild and um, went for a while, I actually had to go, and this is what I love about the wild vegetarian diet. It's, I call it equal opportunity because you can be plants, you can be sea, you can be land, you can be combo platter. It really speaks to what is your body needing right now? And with my liver being so delicate, in such a delicate place, I actually went vegan for a little bit so I could bring those liver enzymes down. But what was so fascinating, Stephanie, is once I figured it out within two weeks, my liver enzymes went from 400 to 30. Wow. And, you know, that in, in, wow. in old clinical literature is like, it's not happening. That, that right. just possibly can't happen. But we, you know, we have the, the evidence there. So, um, that really helped inform the writing of the book. I was literally living through um, what the food supply and stress can do to, to a body and then how quickly recovery can happen when you start giving the body what it needs. And I want to tell our listeners what their bodies need. I want to get to how you do eat, but I want to stay on the problem for a moment here and talk a little bit more about mycotoxins. And then I want to get into glyphosate before we get to the solution, right? <laughs> uh, so let's go back to mycotoxins. Can you, for the listeners, just so that they can kind of scrutinize their, their current diet list for them, the food groups that are going to be the highest in mycotoxins. So you mentioned peanuts, of course, what other foods are going to be high? So Mycotoxins are anything that can uh, uh, live in or be a part of a mold containing organism. And so mushrooms, you know, mushrooms are being deemed to be, you know, so immune modulating, yet any, any client of mine that has strep or candida or any kind of aspergillus, I really just don't give them any form of mushroom, whether supplementally or sure. in a food form. Um, we have the peas, the green peas, um, peas or legumes, legumes tend to be a high, high mold. Um, so those mycotoxins that then build aspergillus, um, which is a mold, uh, can then set off, which is really interesting. So we have the mycotoxins, which are the corn, the peas, the peanuts, soy, of course. Uh, we have green beans. Uh, we have uh, actually even Brazil nuts are high in mold. Pistachios are high in mold. Berries can be high in mold. Grapes are high in mold. Uh, you know, when it grows on it, cantaloupe, actually. Uh, well, of course, wine from the grapes. Yeah. <laughs> grapes, yes. And, and coffee. Yeah. And coffee. That's why it's so important to do that low mold, uh, low acid coffee and the uh, unsulfur, no added sulfite uh, wine um, to your repertoire if you're going to consume wine. So those are all part of that mycotoxic family. And then what's so interesting is that oxalates will make, they feed aspergillus in a state of, of uh, a high mold. Um, some of the foods you mentioned, the legumes are gonna be high in oxalates. So which, which legumes are you okay with? Which are you not okay with? How do you recommend they be prepared? Let's talk about oxalates. <laughs> what's, what's really interesting, and we may wanna then move into the to the why and why the oxalates are a problematic right now. But uh, before we do that, oxalates uh, are contained in really healthy foods such as almonds yeah. and black beans and spinach and Swiss chard and berries. And so what's happening is we're having trouble breaking down the oxalates because our microorganisms within our gut has shifted due to an exogenous bad boy, which is glyphosate, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but these oxalates are helping to create aspergillus, and aspergillus helps to increase the oxalate load. And so oxalates are really, uh, we know oxalates in the past in terms of kidney stones, right. and stones which can which are basically oxalate crystals. But now we know that high oxalates can, they're contributory to exacerbating autism um, because of how they uh, affect neurotransmission, dopamine, serotonin, epinephrine, all those uh, neurotransmitters. So we're creating this perfect storm through our food supply. 
and I'm a, I'm a, a disruptor even in the functional space because a lot of a lot of our you know uh, brethren and, and, and uh, you know colleagues sisters are in the past and myself included was like pro sulfur pro oxalate but I have changed because our macrocosm has changed as well and so um, nuts which almonds and but and, and nuts can be oxalates I had one client literally tell me you're right Terry nuts were making me nuts you know wow yeah they were really facilitating a disruption in her, in her biology. But. Now, when you think of preparing some of the foods that have oxalates in them, like beans, like I, I know if you use a, a pressure cooker, you're going to reduce the lectins. Will you also reduce the oxalates by doing that or not? Not really. I mean, oxalates Shoot. are inherent in there. Um, and then one of the worst ones, I call it killer kale. So uh, kale is both oxalate and sulfur rich, and it's also very, very heavy in its, um, it, it's a sponge for pesticides, you know, so it really, it really carries a lot of toxins, so. So buy um, organic if you're going to eat it, and, and I, I do want to say to the listeners too, although we're talking about all these things you can't eat, I know that in your, with your method and what I do with my patients is we do look at one's genes, because some individuals can have some organic kale, right? We're not saying everyone should never touch kale or should never touch beans. I, I believe that's not what you're saying. We, we very much need to focus on ones. <laughs> uh, I treat the biochemical individuality of that patient. And so I have had kidney stones. So I, I have looked into if I have genes that can increase <laughs> the predisposition to making um, kidney stones. And so there are four different genes I look at with my patients to see if they're they're at increased risk. And so some of those individuals, yes, of course, need to be on a, a lower kale or lower oxalate diet, but not everyone needs to be. Not, not everyone. And as a matter of fact, we will change over the course of our lifetime. As a matter of fact, one of our clients from this morning who happens to have the Sulox gene and the Hoga gene and the, um, and the CBS gene right now, she just had a baby. And she also has EMTHFR C677B polymorphism which goes to methylation and biosynthesis so she's fat malabsorbed and she's recycling estrogen so in her case i'm saying eat a bunch of cruciferous vegetables right now because they impart dim which helps to metabolize estrogen and and upregulate phase one liver detoxification so in the past before she was estrogen dominant the sulfur was not her friend but now it is and so things change, things change. But here, as we're, we're in the Washington DC area, we're going into the fall where the leaves fall and so does, and mold lives. And so we say, you know, eat counter seasonally, but you're in a high mold environment and you have certain genes in that season, myself included, I have all the, the bad genes, um, bad, the polymorphisms. <laughs> um, I stay away right now because it's going to affect me. Sure, sure. Let's transition to sulfur. We still got to go back to glyphosate, but let's talk about sulfur a little bit here. So how would one know if they did have poor sulfur metabolism? Um, like what symptoms or reactions to, to foods may they have? So sulfur, we've linked in this practice to irritable bowel, to Crohn's, to ulcerative colitis. 73% of RA has been linked, RA being rheumatoid arthritis. Um, has been linked to an impaired sulfur processing capacity, um, endocrine function, also mental health. Um, there's uh, certain genes that will affect, again, neurotransmission, glutathione beta-synthase, the CBS gene, which I call central broadcasting station, uh, in terms of how that is uh, such a, a, a big gene in impaired sulfur processing. Sure. I, I also tell patients if you eat sulfur rich foods and then you really smell like sulfur, then you probably can't metabolize it very well, right? <laughs> yeah, we do the asparagus test. If you can smell asparagus on the way out, more than likely you have some issues processing your sulfur. Sure. And sulfur is found in a lot of foods. Some of you were alluding to like the cruciferous vegetables. Now there's a time and place where some people actually need more fruits and vegetables that have the sulfur in them. And then there's a time and place where if you have these um, genetic variations like you have, it sounds like you should probably limit the, those sulfur rich vegetables. Exactly. And you know, P5P, which is a form of B6 is really good for the metabolism of sulfur and oxalates. Um, I've also developed uh, my own supplement, um, that has watermelon, cilantro, and sea salt, and we've just had tremendous success in 
managing sulfur and oxalate metabolism, especially in celiacs, because we're finding in every one of my celiacs, uh, they have impaired sulfur and oxalate metabolism. It, it attacks the gut. Wow. Very interesting. Okay, let's go back to glyphosate. So most of my listeners probably know what glyphosate is, but can you can you tell us why glyphosate is so bad? Yeah, glyphosate is really a bad, 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 bad. <laughs> so glyphosate uh, is the active ingredient in the herbicide now. And the brilliant work of Dr. Stephanie Seneff, a biochemist at MIT, has proven that glyphosate is an imposter. It creates, it becomes an analog to glycine. And glycine is an amino acid so important in the uh, making of hydrochloric acid, which is super important in how we break down protein and how that hydrochloric acid unlocks the enzymes secreted by the pancreas, um, all of our pepsin, trypsin, um, peptidase, and, and so forth. And so it's impaired our body's ability to digest protein. It also acts as an analog to L-serine, which is so important for mental health and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Oh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and uh, dementia. And then it has impaired the body's ability to convert sulfur to its wonderful end product of sulfate. We get stuck in this um, kind of spin cycle and these vegetables, which used to be so healthy for us, are now becoming potentially our enemies. And I can speak to this personally. My genes have not changed, of course, but my ability to digest these sulfur processing compounds has because the glyphosate load, even if we are organic, uh, Seneff notes that there's cross-contamination, our water supply is carrying it. We, it's really hard to get away from the glyphosate. And then the last thing the glyphosate does is that it has somehow impaired our body's ability to produce the microorganisms in our microbiome, which metabolize oxalate. So it has just far reaching, far reaching negative impacts on our microbiology within our gut. But then when all of those things happen, then we inadvertently can express those genes that then exacerbate the problem for us. And you know, to Ben Lynch's uh, brilliant work is that, and we've seen this in our practice, where you can have dirty genes. So even though you may not exhibit the gene polymorphism, you're acting like you do. And so we still have to be, you know, we, we have to marry their genetic blueprint to their current state of health and symptomology and see if in, in some cases they could be um, experiencing that situation. I like how you say the current state of health, because I do think that does determine how we can eat, right? So when our health, when we're in good health and under less stress, a lot of our, our genetic, we'll say defects or variations are not necessarily going to be significant for us. And then there are going to be times in our life where they're extremely significant for us. So yeah, our, our current state of health can determine how we need to be eating, but we all need to be eating well most of the time anyways. <laughs> um, I've heard that you have visited, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Joe um, Salatan's Polyface Farms yes. in, or farm in Virginia. He's been on so many documentaries, so I've seen him, you know, for, for years, but how, what was that experience like and what he's doing? Incredible. I attended the last, the last ever lunatic store <laughs> and there were people from, I believe, 30 countries. Wow. Obviously pre COVID they were, there were 1200 of us gathered for wow. you know, a full day and really understanding how he created he, can, he really transformed this barren piece of property in Swoop, Virginia, which is near Charlottesville, into this utopia for animals and how they, um, the chickens, how he doesn't let them, they're, they're free range, truly free range for all of their lives, but they rotate and how their um, excrement is actually repopulating the nourishment of the soul, soil. So he had the animals 
becoming you know, part of the solution in terms of what their byproducts were and how their, their pigs were foraged, which was effectively, I believe that his pigs are like wild boar and pigs have uh, yeah. they've been known to be dirty, but it actually has a very high amino acid leucine, which is super antiviral. So when I cheat, if you will, as a wild and not to eat non wild, I can very much tolerate pork, especially his pork where they're eating pine cones and pine needles and they're foraging in the, in the woods. And so um, it was really beautiful to see how, um, how much love was uh, poured into the land and the animals and how respectful they were treated during their lifetime. Um, you know, I do believe, and I, I, when I read Omnivore's Dilemma, um, where he was quoted and featured, um, I, I wept. And that was, my gosh, almost 15 years ago. Um, where I do believe we're meant to be opportunistic carnivores. That's why we have our canines. Uh, you know, um, not all of us, and, and again, we're our current state of health. I'm not naturally a vegan, but I needed to be vegan when I was really ill. And so um, using that dynamic and philosophy, I think we can navigate longevity handily, understanding why our body is what our body is saying it, saying at the time and why it's saying it. Sure. That's a great feedback mechanism. Joe Rogan has an amazing podcast with him that any of, if any of the listeners want to listen to a long podcast, <laughs> he, I mean, he talks about what he's doing and it's, it's truly amazing. So I encourage you to listen to that. Um, let's go back to poop for a minute. So poop is important because we need that poop in our soil so that our soil can produce <laughs> um, food rich in nutrients. Um, so at which our, we know our soils become very, very depleted these days. So not just talking about um, poop, but also gas. I want to talk about the methane from cows <laughs> um, leading to higher, you know, um, CO2 levels in the air that some individuals are so concerned about. Uh, I want to ask about your theory on that and why you think that has all, all of a sudden become a problem when we've had cows, you know, on this earth for a long time. Yeah, so I, I do believe that, you know, there has been a significant change and it's because cows are herbivores. They're meant to feed on grass. They're not meant to feed on corn. And so when we are feeding and then corn in their own, which is um, animal, animal byproducts, they are no longer able to properly digest and metabolize their food source. And so they are gassing, off gassing truly uh, think about when we can't digest something, we have flatulence. You know, people think that they're supposed to flatulate daily. Well, I can tell you if you're really a uh, poop talks, I can't, you know, I, I say, let's talk poop and let it, let poop talk to you. You know, your, your, your stool should be a certain color, a certain consistency. It should not have a massive odor. You know, mm -hmm. if you have gas, it should not be, it should not be uh, odiferous. Mm -hmm. And you really shouldn't be gassing, Other, otherwise you're having some level of indigestion and fermentation and potentially putrefaction. So my personal theory, albeit not yet proven, is that we have we have really done a number on our on our animals in the way that we treat and feed them, uh, in a way that is so contributing to the carbon footprint. Sure. All right. Let's go back to the Cochrane Method. So what is the Cochrane Method? So the Cochrane Method is a bio-individual methodology rooted in biochemistry and quantum biology and biophysics and musculoskeletal um, in nutrition. And I use my uh, adapted form of applied kinesiology to allow uh, the body to inform the practitioner as to what exactly is going on. And what I love about this methodology, it's in real time. And I have a naturopathic doctor that works with us and we work very collaboratively with doctors across the country actually. And you know, when we, when we collaborate in, with them and we do the, the saliva, the blood, the stool, all the, you know, all the bells and whistles in many cases, if not in all cases, um, the muscle testing is corroborated by the other testing. And what the Cochrane Method seeks to do is to look to a footprint of genetic 
possibility. And then the four portals of environment, which is food and toxins and heavy metals, um, food being the other, the big one, um, pathogenic load, which are the viruses, not just IgM, real virus, you know, that is, oh, I got a new viral infection, but the reactivation of viruses, the overgrowth of bacteria, fungi, parasites. Um, we have the emotional piece, which that's the fat piece of uh, the third tenet of wild vegetarianism, where we know that um, when we uh, secrete epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, it literally in our biology, microbiology, will increase the pathogenicity of our organisms, making them bullies. Uh, it increases fat metabolism impairment. It leaks the gut. It just has a lot of um, deleterious effects. So the emotional piece is a big piece. And uh, one of the things that didn't make the book, uh, which is we now know that there's a human bio, bio field, which is a field of information that lives outside of us. That's been proven by uh, a biophysicist and NIH has done many studies on that, on how our energy really impacts our uh, our DNA expression and what, what our thoughts are uh, so powerful. And then the last thing is a physical impact. If you are hit, if you are injured, um, if there's trauma to the body, it can elicit a cascade of, of um, changes. Sure. You have just launched the Global Sustainable Health Institute. So tell us some, what that is. Well, I'm really proud of that because for many, uh, many years I've been asked, Terry, what are you an expert in? <laughs> and we're like, well, am I an expert in autoimmunity? Am I an expert in Lyme? Am I an expert in um, Hashimoto's or fertility or mental health? And really what we realize is that we, we are an expert in body <laughs> uh, because you can't separate one from the other. And for many, many years I've been uh, asked by practitioners of all kinds, MDs, NDs, ODs, uh, chiropractors, you name it, to shadow my practice because it's, um, it's a pioneering work. And the, 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 the results prove it. And so I finally decided, and it was really interesting, it was before the novel season came into being, but right before that happened, I was, I was nudged to really teach my methodology. And so the, the Global Sustainable Health Institute is a platform from one-to-one -one and I'm a clinical practice to one-to-many where the Cochrane method will be, um, will be taught. We're, we're right now in the early stages of partnering with um, a wonderful human out of Canada, where we're going to teach uh, Lyme through the lens of the Cochrane method to, and we're putting a practitioner model together. And then um, it's really taking and scaling this wild Italian approach to um, institutions that, you know, now more than ever, immunity is the thing, you know, mm -hmm. immunity and, and longevity is the long game. If we do a short-term approach to food and, and our, how we live our lives, it's short-term and it's uh, results as well. So we have to seek to be sustainable in our health. And as you stated earlier, and we're uh, uh, completely aligned as longevity starts in the womb. And we have seen this uh, through the uh, babies <laughs> that we've taken through our process for a decade or more. And women that have been told they're, in, forget it, you're infertile and you will never have a child. And now they've born children healthfully without any external intervention, hormonal intervention. And these children, if you look at them and compare them to their siblings, they're more robust. They don't have um, the allergies. We have a child now that um, the mom got pregnant at 43 and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, we come with a warning label. <laughs> um, and her son, she has three boys now, her other two sons are anaphylactic to uh, molds and nuts and all sorts of things and uh, trees. And this little guy, William, he's like a little tank. He's now gonna be two and there's zero things that are, you know, he's not gotten sick, he's not allergic to anything. And because when she got pregnant, we married the genetic blueprint of she and her husband and she ate to the intersection of the genetic blueprint of the parents. And this little guy is amazing. And so that's proof positive that we just had another one, our first client again, the one that's now having a little estrogen dominance. Her child, her first child was on the spectrum 
this child is so robust and when he eats outside of his genetic blueprint, it's an immediate feedback loop, but that mom knows. So it, there's no guessing. And this little guy is just, just thriving. He's, he'll be a year old next month and there's, he's not been sick once. Hmm. Wonderful. So let's talk about what we can eat on the wildatarian diet. So can you kind of break down grains and proteins? Tell us what you eat every day. And I know you're eating for your genetic <laughs> you know, blueprint, but tell us what is included on the wildatarian diet. So the wildatarian diet is going to be based on four major archetypes that I have developed. It's either going to be a basic wildatarian where you're just low on amyloids. And I cannot stress enough how important that we stay away from things that make amyloid plaques <laughs> or amyloid fibrils that we're ingesting. We have to really reduce that. Um, you can be a low sulfur wildatarian, which is what I am. So you're going to avoid those cruciferous vegetables um, and a lot of egg yolk that also is um, uh, sulfuric and garlic and onion. I can do cooked garlic and onion. And I can do broccoli and cauliflower as well, but I'm not going to do them every day. And I'm certainly not going to juice with kale because that I've tried that before and I've literally gotten sick. Um, and then there's a low fat wild vegetarian, uh, which is if you're eating, if you have certain genetic predispositions where you're not breaking down fat, then anything that's high fat, such as even salmon, you know, can really clog up the works from a hormonal perspective, from a neurotransmitter perspective, from a gut perspective. So we're gonna go lower fat. Um, and then the um, there's a low fat, low sulfur wild vegetarian, which you're gonna incorporate that. And then we have a little tail, which is the low oxalate. So what do I eat? Well, this morning I had a smoothie that was made with avocado and mango and some, um, fish collagen. And for lunch, I'm going to have bison with fresh lettuce and uh, heirloom tomatoes. Last night, I had lamb with some carrots and some uh, roasted potatoes. Uh, I went out to dinner, but that was at the restaurant and it was available and it was completely wild. So what we, what we tend to say is if you stay away from the glyphosate, which is found in gluten, uh, if you stay away from the mycotoxins, which is found in the, the certain beans and, and um, nuts, and if you stay away from the uh, sulfur, if you have that issue, that what I do instead is I gravitate towards my squash. Um, love all kinds of squash in terms of my vegetables, my eggplant. They used to think that nightshades, which include eggplant, tomato, and peppers, and potatoes, was a problem. Well, in my practice, we've seen it's really the sulfur and the oxalate that can conditions. And so I, I eat liberally my eggplant, my, my peppers, roasted peppers, my um, tomatoes of all kinds, um, potatoes here and there, but more, more likely sweet potatoes. I love my cucumber. I love my cilantro. It's such a great, um, great detoxifier. All kinds of lettuce, but not arugula or kale, but my bib, my Boston, my lamb. And then the fruit, papaya is amazing because it has happen and it's a great digestive aid. Um, I don't do well with citrus because it, it acidifies me. But um, again, mango, papaya, I limit my berries because of the oxalates, but I love right now we're in peach season. That's incredible. But I don't need a lot of, I don't need a lot of cantaloupe because that's high milk, but I do eat a lot of watermelon. See, that, that sounds amazing, but I have fructose intolerance. So all, a lot of the things you said, I cannot have when you're saying watermelon and peach and squash and, you know, a lot of those, <laughs> I'm thinking that sounds delicious, but so, you know, if someone had fructose intolerance, they can't necessarily uh, consume those. But that's also why having a practitioner to work with you <laughs> is so invaluable to help you personalize your diet. No, it's absolutely right. And so what's, what, what we say is there's no one food or supplement for everyone. And right. For you could be poison for me and vice versa. Right. So, you know, for me, I do low legume. I usually, I try to do uh, pinto or um, what I have found that the pinto and the great northern can be on some level. They have some antiviral properties. I, black beans are high, high um, oxalate. So uh, because I'm, and, and I'm Cuban, so I grew up on black beans, but um, I have to be, I have to be respectful. But if I, what I found too is if you pair, so if I pair my black beans with mango, which is really high in vitamin A, which really helps the epithelial lining of the gut and high in iodine, I can actually do that pairing and be okay. Hmm. So sometimes it's just not that one food. It's like when you pair it with something your body really loves, then sure. you, you can get away with it. But if you do two fringe foods, I call I call the foods for our clients. You have center lane foods and those you can you can drive down that lane every day. 
and then you have your fringe foods and you're going to be really respectful of those fringe foods but if you pair a fringe with the center lane you should be okay unless there's something else going on but don't do a bunch of fringe foods on the same day because your body's going to go oh crap right so um i just you know and i eat wild so i'm lucky my lamb my my um bison lamb bison elk venison and where do you get these? So where, where are you finding these? If you don't, I'm in Iowa, so I mean, I do have some farming relatives who could occasionally get me some wild game, but, but where, where, are, where am I going to find, I can find lamb, but where am I going to find some of these? Are there certain um, companies that you, you yes, work with or recommend? That's a good question. And, um, you know, in your, the major grocery stores do carry lamb, they carry Cornish game hen. They carry- uh, Did you say Cornish hens? Is that what you said? So that'd be a better choice. Corn, I think you, I've heard you say before, Cornish hens or turkey are safer than chicken. Yes, absolutely. And this little guy who's just ready to turn a year old, his mother says he loves the Cornish hens. He actually sleeps better in time to Japan. So it's helping his sleep and he feels really satiated. Uh, but chicken, again, with that high uh, potential amyloid burden, uh, we, we don't do that. Um, but in your grocery store, so you can get ground bison, you can get lamb, you can get a Cornish hen. Um, you can get um, the fish sometimes, you know, Whole Foods has a lot of wild of everything. Sure. Um, wild fish. Um, and then there are two major providers that I know of, Dartanian Foods, which ships to 50 states overnight. Blackwing uh, Farms out of, um, I believe it's Wisconsin also, but Thrive Market, uh, had good, you could get, avail yourself of some potentially good fish and then Vital Choice. Um, Vital Choice has some really great wild fish and shellfish that um, your your listeners could avail themselves of. And and you know I even in COVID I've been traveling a little bit and I just was on the West Coast and I navigated you know I navigate my wild vegetarian uh, um, palate and and lifestyle. When you travel it's not perfect, but then I'm taking my supplements again. You know supplements help mitigate. So I'm going to be mm -hmm. a little bit higher. I'm taking my B6. I'm taking my wild lights. Every day I'm taking a quercetin because not only is it an antihistamine, but it's been proven to lower oxalate loads. So, um, you know, we have to marry uh, the supplements with the food and not all supplements are great for everyone. When I was high viral glutathione, which is thought to be such a powerful antioxidant, the master antioxidant, actually was really, really bad for me. I took one dose of glutathione. I thought I'd been shocked by, you know, like uh, electrical, system that really affected my uh, neurology. Now I can take glutathione and glutathione it has been touted to be you know, really great. Uh, it has some um, viral uh, mitigating properties. So I take it now regularly. My body couldn't handle it then, but it can handle it now. And so again, you know, to your listeners, as we become sustainable in our health profile, there's a lot more that we can do and we can dance with uh, a, you know, a bounty of foods that, um, that we may not have been able to touch before. Sure. Well, I'm happy to hear that you are back to health. I want to hear about your son though. So how is your son? Oh, he just moved to Richmond, Virginia. He just started working for him there. Of course, I'm really proud of him. So my son, that was, um, he's 26 now. He, um, he has no residue of asthma. He has, he's robust. He ended up being a gold medalist in Junior Olympics with karate. He um, grew to five feet 11. He um, was um, you know, really an a academic and a, um, um, a singer, songwriter, athlete. So he, he's done you know, extremely well. And uh, he's, what's so beautiful, Stephanie, is that he's so tuned into his body. Um, when he comes in and he sees my natural practice, because I'm his mom, uh, to our practice, you know, they have roundly given me feedback on, boy, he really knows his stuff. He really knows his body. And, um, you know, he's not taken a, a course in it, but he's just taken it. He's lived it. And so that's one of the things that we seek uh, to do in our practice. And I believe we, we have succeeded is we are educators and we educate our clients. So they are empowered and informed and they understand why. And they can pull themselves off the ledge in most cases uh, because they're like, oh yeah, now I know if I ate that, I felt terrible. And, and it's not so, there's not so much static in the body that they're completely confused. 
Great to hear. Great to hear. Well, tell us where listeners can connect with you. Of course, happy to. So um, you can connect with me through globalsustainableinstitute.com. Uh, you can connect, connect with me through terrycochran.com. Uh, and of course, my book is on Amazon. And we have a private practice here in the DC area. We have the Wild Vegetarian book and the Heal and Seal program. We have many programs on our website if you can't come see us. Uh, we have a detox program. We have a uh, meal prep program. We have the, the more kind of the signature program of the Wild Vegetarian Diet, which is the Heal and Seal. And we can heal and seal our gut. I say we can eat rocks. It's a metaphor, but it's true. You know, we can really be robust in our, in our gut biome and, um, and, and its integrity. Then we have a much broader uh, place from which to um, um, support our, our nourishment. So, and we have, I'm all over social media, so. I, I will put a plug in for your book there also. Uh, it does include several recipes. So if you're kind of wondering, how am I gonna, you know, cook some of these, these foods? She, she does have, you do have recipes uh, included in your book, which is great, very helpful. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and shedding light on something I had a lot of curiosity about. I'm happy you got to clarify some of my questions today and I won't probably be eating chicken for a while. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much for talking about oxalates and sulfur and um, glyphosate and amyloids, things that many of my listeners probably didn't know much about. So we appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the show. Of course, my great pleasure.